Whenever you're ready. Uh, welcome, everyone. Everybody awake? Everybody got their first, second, or third cup of coffee like I needed this morning? Yep, yep. All right. Uh, my name is Mark Brown. I'm on the uh, planning committee for the InfoSec event and also a member of the local Middle Tennessee ISSA chapter. How many Middle Tennessee ISSA members have we got in the room? Great, I see a few hands. If you haven't checked out the Middle Tennessee ISSA chapter, I do encourage you to do so. Uh, you can go to, after the event, you can go to mid 10 mitn.issa.org and find out more about it. would love for you to do so. Today, we're all here to listen to Adrian Crenshaw. Now, how many of you know Adrian by his alternate name on the internet? I see quite a few hands. Uh, Adrian is is much more popular on the internet, I must say, as than I am in real life. That's for sure. As a personality <laughs> called Iron Geek, and so uh, he'll be telling you more about his website. It's a great place for you to go and check out uh, security training and lots of videos that he's put together. Adrian's been at lots of different conferences, um, many more than I'm going to mention right now, but Black Hat and DEF CON and definitely the uh, Kentuckiana area security conferences. He's been a, a strategic member of the ISSA there and putting those conferences together. Most recently, he's put together the Capture the Flag event for the upcoming um, yeah. Derby Con. Well, someone else is doing that Capture the Back Flag event. I'll be doing the uh, you know, King of the Hill at the Louisville InfoSec. The then Louisville. Dave Kennedy's team, I believe, is going to be doing a, a Capture the Flag event at Derby Con, which hopefully should be really good. Excellent. Excellent. So he's got a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, and I'm sure that you're all going to enjoy hearing him today. Come on, go ahead and pack in if you can. Uh, I'm going to ask because we've got a few people that are coming in a little bit later. If you can slide towards the walls and uh, let people slide in, that's going to make things a lot easier. Um, Come on, get cozy. A couple other housekeeping items that I want you to be aware of. Uh, how many of you are familiar with CPEs or Continuing Professional Education Credits? Okay, if you need those, there is a card. Uh, it looks like this, and I have a few extra if you need one. But uh, throughout the day, you're going to have the opportunity at the end of each of these breakout sessions to get a dot. In this session, it's a red dot you'll get from me. And uh, you'll put that on the appropriate place here and fill out your information and turn it in at the registration table, and that's how you get CPE for the day. Um, any questions about that? I do have extra cards. Anybody that needs an extra card, please raise your hand. Go ahead and hand those out real quick right now while we still got people filtering in. Anybody else? Adrian is sitting with his thoughts. Mm -hmm. All right. With uh, no further, no further ado, here. Let me. Um, no further ado, uh, I give you uh, Iron Geek. Just give me my hand. Hello, everybody. I'm not even sure this thing's doing anything. Luckily, I can talk loud. So, um, everybody can hear me, okay? Correct. All right, the talk you're sitting in, I've roughly titled Pilfering Local Data, Things in Attack I Might Want to Grab with Short-Term Access. First of all, a little bit about me. My name is Adrian Crenshaw. I run IronGeek.com. We specialize in security tutorials and videos covering various pen test topics, uh, anonymity topics, just whatever strikes my fancy at the time. It started off being computers and weightlifting, and slowly it became all computers, then more or less became all security. I have an interest in InfoSec education. I don't really think I'm just a geek with power in my hands. It's possible I'll get some things wrong if I do. Come up to me, uh, email me. I'd be interested in knowing what's what. Also, a regular on the ISD podcast. We podcast five times a week generally. I'm usually on on Thursday nights. And what I plan on covering this talk are core items an attacker would want to locate and copy off Windows systems with short term access. Um, things like, let's say, data to be found, passwords, usernames, uh, emails, certain paths on the local network. And also, we'll cover lightly tools that can be used to bypass weak security precautions like file system permissions and not so much OS and BIOS passwords, though. Generally, if you have physical access to the box that's locked and you can get in there and rip the battery, you're good to go. 
this is the original mandate I had for um, this talk because I was asked, well, you want to come talk at Nashville? Give us a subject. They're like, okay, uh, I've been doing all these talks recently on bootable media. So let's go ahead and put that into practice using the bootable media to grab certain files. Then I realized, um, well, why is talk is sort of a sham? I started asking around for ideas and someone said, well, you have short-term access to the system. Your goal should be long-term access. Uh, Aiden Santabrio was one of the other people that um, said that. Uh, so I started thinking about it. Yeah, he's right. However, this is the topic I put in. So really, I should do another talk sometime on like designing Trojan droppers for the machine. And actually, there might be someone else in the room that could do that better than I can. Talk idea for you. All right. So another problem with this talk subject before I thought about it, there's so many different options of files you might want to grab. I mean, what might be important? Well, ideally, you'd make an image of the entire hard drive to find everything. So I'm asking about what files would you want to grab with short-term access to a machine that could lead to further compromise, and the list is just too long to cover in any reasonable amount of time. Especially if you cover more than one operating system. Here I'm mostly covering Windows, specifically Windows Vista, Windows 7 generation. Um, hopefully this uh, talk will still be useful for people who are um, interested from the standpoint of machines that are stolen or decommissioned equipment. It may also help emphasize the importance of before you donate a machine, either taking a hard drive and shredding it or at least wiping it. Probably wiping it, going down the hard, entire hard drive and zeroing it all out. And yes, before anybody debates me with this, I can show you some research. A single overwrite, enough. That and said, there's something called bad block lists that are not actually overridden by things like D-Ban. Different subject for a different time. Uh, maybe still be safe just to rip the drive out and put bubbles through it. For those of you who don't afford a shredder that can do hard drives. So I hope it's useful for those uh, contexts. For machines that are going to be redeployed inside of a network, I imagine a pen tester or an attacker would be more interested in getting long-term access. But sometimes a machine might be stolen. What can someone find off of that particular box? Or if they have only short-term access and they don't want to drop anything in the box that can be found later, what might they go after? So, how to get at this data? There's several different options. I mean, you could always pull the hard drive out um, and look at another machine. But I've been messing a lot with a different boot environments. You can boot from a CD-ROM, a DVD, or a thumb drive. I carry around a thumb drive here that's, uh, I think I paid $21 when I bought it. I think it's probably cheaper now. A 16 gig drive that I have partitioning tools on. I have a version of Windows I can boot from. I have Backtrack. I have a couple of anonymity, uh, well, at least one anonymity uh, distribution Linux called Tails. There's so many things you can carry on. Just a little bitty thumb drive that fits in your back wall that you can sit on and still not break. But a few distributions you could look into using would be like Backtrack Linux, support for NTFS, go on there, grab the files you want, uh, Bots PE Builder or Ultimate Boot CD for Windows, which is a cut down version of uh, Windows XP you can boot from a CD-ROM or a USB drive. Don't be overly about writing down any of this because all these slides will be up on my uh, website very shortly. And um, if you find them at the conference, just come up to me and I can give you a copy if you trust plugging a USB device into my machine. Uh, my current uh, boot environment of choice, at least for like using Windows tools, is WinBuilder. There's a distribution of WinBuilder called Windows 7 PSE, where you can make a bootable thumb drive or DVD based on Windows 7. Um, and of course, Conboot is also an interesting thing to use. Have you seen Conboot? Depending on what you boot from, or depending on the system that's actually running on the hard drive, you can boot from it, access a bootloader, modify its memory, and you log into a machine with either a known password in the case of a uh, Linux-like operating system, Linux, or uh, a blank password in the case of Windows. But it's kind of hit or miss, and I've had a lot of bad luck trying to get it to ever work on a 64-bit system. And the things I've read make it a little questionable whether or not that's supported. I'm still not quite sure. But uh, it's another thing to look into. Uh, Backtrack Linux, like I said, it's a, if you do any kind of pen testing, you're probably familiar with Backtrack Linux. One of the developers is actually fairly local to me. Uh, great support for hardware. If you're trying to do anything wireless, it's awesome because having people have had to try to modify their kernel to get some little wireless exploitation tool to work. They done that work for you, which is a huge, huge benefit. Uh, very well maintained. I think they're on uh, Backtrack release, Backtrack 5 release 1 now. Uh, just an awesome distribution. Bots PE is essentially, 
Ultimate Boot CD for Windows is essentially a version of Bot PE Builder with extra tools packed in already. These plugins that are written that automatically have um, already there with all the tools you need for doing things like defanging your hard drive, maybe uh, recovering uh, deleted files, stuff like that. And the Ultimate Boot CD for Windows is based on Bot PE Builder. Uh, also, Ultimate Boot CD for Windows comes with a few other things on the multi boot, like uh, D band for wiping hard drives. But since you're running Windows XP on it, since you're a cut down version of Windows XP, uh, Windows P to be more specific, uh, you have great NTFS support and you can get there and get to any of the files that you want. Also, they have various tools on there for um, mounting the registry that's on the hard drive in the machine, so you can start looking through the registry, grabbing stuff out of it. Uh, there's a tool for both uh, Ultimate Boot Steve from Windows, or Bots PE Builder, and uh, also Win Builder, which I'll be talking about in a second, called um, Solace Password Renew, which is awesome. You use it, it'll write to the local hard drive, install a service, and as soon as you boot the machine up, it'll make a new administrator account for you that you can log in and do your stuff. It'll also reset other people's passwords, but that's not so... That's not always a great idea because, well, that's leaving evidence, more evidence that you're there because the password, wait, what happened to it? It's changed. And the other issue with that is if you change the password and you do it in an offline manner, you may not be able to use that password to get in and get some of the other data I'll be showing here in a bit. Because that, that, I believe the hash of that password is used for encrypting certain data we might want to extract out. If you start changing it, well, you can't get the data. Uh, so I said, the one I'm currently using most is a uh, Win Builder, specifically the project called Win Set, uh, Windows 7 uh, PE SE. So that's awesome, you can build from a 32 bit or a 64 bit base OS. I usually use 32 bit, so I have uh, probably a little wider driver support. Uh, very hardcore roll your own sort of thing. If you want to write your own scripts, you can add new tools to it. I ghost boxes from this, I do, uh, do file system recovery. I use that Solid password, Solid password re re uh, Renew tool. Uh, grab files off of down system, just a ton, a ton of different options. If you want to run sniffers, you can you know, install Wireshark on it and go to town. And I have a whole other talk just on building this environment where you can basically carry that around a version of Windows in your pocket, boot from it on a machine and essentially have your way of the hard drive, assuming they're not doing full hard drive encryption. The common boot is a little different thing. Uh, basically it changes uh, information in memory and acts as a bootloader so that when it loads up to OS, it modifies things to where you can log in either with a known password, a uh, con user in the case of Linux, or uh, a blank password in the case of Windows. And it can come in quite handy. Now it's not designed to boot from a thumb drive. I've made a slightly hacked version using um, SysLinux that, I think it's SysLinux I used, that sometimes works from a thumb drive, but it's very hit or miss. It's meant to be uh, booted from a, either a CD-ROM or a floppy disk. But the, besides just having local access, sometimes someone might be remote and they still can get access to the local file system and grab certain files that I'll be talking about here shortly. How many people have ever used Metasploit? All right, great exploitation framework. Uh, there's certain front ends for it as well. There's the official uh, Metasploit GUI. The one I'm showing right here is Armitage. And essentially what I've done is I've done a sweep of my entire network, compromised every machine I could using the base uh, DB Autopone, got in, and now I can look at the file system and start sucking file off of that after I've been compromised. And there's actually um, post exploitation scripts you can run from inside Metasploit using the uh, Metrifter payload that are specifically designed for things like, well, grab me the Firefox credentials, or grab me this, or grab me that. There's a guy named uh, Carlos Perez who does a lot of work on post exploitation, so I recommend uh, Googling up his work. And I believe a lot of the scripts in there are stuff that he's actually written. Alright, some useful tools once you actually get the data. And I'm also going to be covering what data is out there. Uh, you'll see me reference these people a lot. Uh, Neosoft produces a lot of freeware tools for extracting passwords. In some cases you have to be uh, booted from the machine in the uh, context of the user you want to extract passwords for. In some cases you just point at a certain file and it will extract passwords for you. He also has tools for uh, recovering history, uh, looking at in the caches in a more convenient fashion. For instance, looking at the cache by hand on Firefox is a bit of a pain. He has tools to massively simplify that. I'm going to be recommending some of his individual tools, but he has something out there called Near Launcher, which when you download this package, you get like all of his tools in one, I don't know how big it is, maybe a 20 meg download. 
and get tons and tons of great tools for recovering information, recovering passwords, as well as general networking utilities and all sorts of other odds and ends. Uh, another tool we're talking about from time to time is Kane. Kane has a lot of uh, functionality as far as cracking different types of passwords and as well as uh, extracting password hashes from certain file types which I'll be talking about as well. Now, the first type of um, data I'm going to be talking about trying to extract from a system would be things like um, passwords. And there's a few key files you'll probably want to grab if you're interested in passwords. Now the Windows System Trifecta, these are the ones you definitely want to grab. You're, everything inside of uh, Windows System 32 config you probably want to grab, but at least SAM, System, and Security. These are registry hives. These are the files that are actually mounted when you start looking around in the registry. Grab all these files, and for that matter, for each individual user, the ntuser.dat, for that, you know, the current user part of the registry, that's inside the ntuser.dat, inside that person's profile. Uh, also, while you're at it, grab software. There's a few things you can extract from that as well. So SAM, system, security, and software all inside of sys32config, and ntuser.dat inside of a person's profile. And I'll show you why you want to grab that here in a second. With tools like Kane, if you grab those hives, system and security, even if you're not booted from the machine, you can grab those files, take it into a box, you can dump LSA secrets, which you'll sometimes find passwords stored in, you can uh, dump cached passwords from the system. Um, have you ever noticed when, right, I'm assuming some of you all mess around with Active Directory and have a box that occasionally isn't actually connected to a network where it can get into the domain controllers? But you can still log in, even though you can't actually authenticate against the domain controllers. The reason you can do that is, by default, Windows caches the last 10 accounts that logged in, so when the person tries to log in, they still can't, even if they can't talk to the domain controllers. Well, the way these passwords are cached, with enough effort, you can brute force those hashes and recover them, or recover the actual password that originally went into it. But you need the system and security uh, registry highs for that. Cracking the SAM file, this would be like local accounts on a machine. Uh, grab SAM and system. If the person's still using LAN Manager, which I'll explain here in a bit, that is uh, pathetically simple on a modern machine, especially if you start using rainbow tables. Um, also, if you're talking about Windows XP box, someone's trying to recover something from, if they can boot from uh, their own media and grab or look at the uh, Windows directory, they can actually extract wireless keys from it that have been stored on the machine. It's apparently a little bit harder to do in uh, Windows Vista and 7. Still doable though if you can get logged in as that person. I mean, why crack uh, someone's WPA if, which was going to be difficult, when you can walk up to the machine without not looking, plug in a thumb drive, run a command, and get all the passwords dumped to you? All right. There are several reasons why an attacker might be interested in finding these local passwords. I mean, the main ones are obvious. Ones that people can access remotely are obvious. But local passwords are also incredibly useful. Um, great way to escalate privileges on a local system, you know, uh, elevate privileges so you can, in cases of some open environments, install games, something as innocuous as that, or sniffers, or keystroke loggers, or so forth. Uh, local passwords could also be used, however, to gain further access across the network. A lot of times, um, people use the same password everywhere. If you crack someone's a password on the SAM file in the SAM file for the local machine, they might be still enough to use the exact same password on, let's say, Facebook or even financial systems. But besides that, if you're talking about a, a uniform environment, more than likely if they're using something like ghost image machines, they have the same local admin password or same local accounts and passwords on all the machines that it's based on that image. So there's also just the fun of doing it. Uh, so let's say this particular scenario. Someone cracks the passwords on one particular machine. Well, a bunch of other machines are all imaged using that same image set. Someone can grab the password from one box and then use that box that it had local access to, grab its password, and use that same one over the network to connect to even more boxes, and thus pivot and uh, leapfrog their way throughout a network. And then, of course, repeat ad nauseum till they get into everything. A little glossary, which I don't think I'll have time to read in this, but um, some of the core things I want to talk about in this, just so you have a, a rough definition. Who here is familiar with the concept of password hashing? Uh, here's the idea. Passwords generally aren't stored in a plain text form. They're generally, if they're worried about security at all, hashed. Basically, they use a one-way function to take 
that password string, turn it into some kind of cryptographic hash or a fixed length, and store that. Whenever someone tries to log in later on, they do the exact same process. They go, okay, let me take this password they gave me, use the same cryptographic hash function, compare it to what I have stored. If it matches, they must have the right password. Well, some of these hashes are easier to crack than others, and there's also something called a hash collision, or the same word that goes in, or a different word that goes in, comes out as the exact same hash. For instance, um, you, some of you may save your mail in uh, Outlook PST files. Well, you can put a password on a PST file, but uh, it uses such a weak hashing algorithm that you may not find out the original password the person used, but you can easily generate a collision and still be able to mount that PST file. Oh, assault is something basically that's added into the hashing algorithm, so it isn't always the same. If you're using a Windows box, uh, you're generally going to have two types of hashes stored. Uh, NTLM and uh, LM hashes, land manager hashes. Uh, NTLM's both is a lot better. How both are unsalted. Basically, on your computer, if, if your password is uh, I love Nashville, and on my machine, my password is I love Nashville, that hash is going to be the same on both your machine and my machine. If it had been salted with something random, or even salted with our usernames, the resulted pa password would be something different. So, salting generally it could be something as simple as take the password to give you, uh, concatenate with something else, and then do the hashing function and store it. The reason why hashing is so important is there's something called um, pre-computation attacks or uh, rainbow tables, where essentially someone's gone through for every possible set of strings, they've already computed all the possible hashes. So they don't have to take the CPU time to do it, and then they can essentially find a password hash and look it up in the table. Uh, what I mean by hashes, here's a few examples, you know, MD2, MD4, MD5, SHA-1, so on and so forth. Also, sometimes people don't even store the password as a, a hash, but they don't store it in plain text either. They store it, however, in an easily, um, easily unencrypted form, or very, they just basically obfuscate it. For instance, um, HTTP uh, basic authentication. Technically, if you watch the password cross the uh, your internet connection, it's not technically clear text because it's not the exact same password, but they use something called Base64 encoding. Well, Base64 encoding is trivially reversed, so you can get the original password. And that's one of the problems with, for instance, like the VNC hash, is uh, it has a known way of reversing it, so it's just it's not really a hash so much as it is an obfuscation. Some uh, great general resources for um, where passwords are going to be stored in a system. Definitely check out Nearsoft's uh, page on it. He basically lists a different bunch of different tools and tells you uh, where that particular application stores its passwords. And there's also a bunch of stuff out on my website about SAM and system cracking specifically. Like I said, don't bother writing these down. I know these URLs are incredibly unfriendly for anybody who is watching the presentation. The notes will be up on my website before awful long. Uh, my buddy's Question Defense in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, they actually do a pass. They have a password cracking service where you can basically uh, go to the Uber box, submit a hash, and have it crack it for you. Uh, what they're doing is they're using GPU cracking. Uh, GPUs, the uh, the the, C the uh, processing unit inside of graphics cards for certain paralyzable tasks, is much much faster than your CPU. So they have special software design, specifically hash uh, Hashcat that can use the GPU and crack these passwords much, much faster than a traditional uh, CPU could. Also, uh, Ron's password list is um, useful stuff to use if you want to uh, try a dictionary attack on a machine. I think Ron's password list, basically he's looked around for various uh, compromises that have happened and where people have dumped the entire password database. And it gives you a good feel for what kind of password people generally choose. All right, assumptions and workarounds. In most cases, these tools and attacks will require physical access to the box. Of course, there's um, exceptions like that Metasploit uh, exception I mentioned in much earlier. And in some cases, uh, you will need to be logged in as the target account. Remember I said that the password is hashed? Well, that hashed password could also be used for encrypting other passwords. Kind of like, um, if you, you remember if you're Mac, and if you, how many of you have Macs? You remember if, you're, if you ever get prompted for a password for your key ring? Well, the password can be used as something like that. So other passwords may be encrypted with that very first password hash. So if you're not logged in as the user who stored that hash, then you're never going to actually be able to recover the passwords. 
also if you try to change it using a third party tool, sometimes you won't be able to recover anything ever because you've changed that key that the secondary passwords were encrypted with. Uh, let's see. Sometimes you can also just boot from a boot CD or a thumb drive and just grab the data. As the case of the Saturn system file, that's pretty much all you have to do. Some other background information on some of the things I'll be covering. Windows profile info. Uh, I'm going to be using throughout this presentation C drive as the root of the uh, OS drive. That's not technically true. It could be on a different drive besides C drive. It's just more convenient to write C colon slash than it is system root or root of the system hard drive. In Windows 7 you're going to, in Vista you're going to find user profiles which I'll be talking about in user C colon slash users and in Windows XP you're going to find it in slash documents and settings. To make things simple and so I don't have a massive amount of text or even more massive amount of text on my PowerPoint slides, I basically truncated this to be profile inside of brackets as shorthand. Now if you ever looked around inside of a Windows uh, Vista or Windows 7 box and saw looking inside of a profile, you might be wondering, I go inside of app data and I see a bunch of folders here that weren't there in XP. What's the difference between local, local, low, and roaming? Well, we'll cover that here in a bit. But that's where a lot of applications store data. So if an application is going to store a password and it doesn't throw it in the registry, it might put it in a file inside of app data. XP has something similar. Um, application data ma roughly maps to uh, roaming and uh, local uh, settings slash application data roughly maps, uh, maps to what on Windows 7 would be just local. If you want more information on what's stored where in a profile of an application, assuming it you know, conforms to normal Windows specifications, there's actually a really unfriendly URL to put in the PowerPoint slides right there that would take you there. Like I said, this presentation will be online shortly or I can give you the slides. More than anything, I wanted to get across a lot of information in this uh, talk that you can take home and go, okay, that sounded interesting, let me go read up on it. More details though, on as far as the whole Vista Windows 7 style user profile, inside of app data, inside of roaming is where you're going to find most of the files that our applications leave behind. Uh, essentially, these are synchronized with a server if you have roaming profiles enabled. And what, part of the idea is you wouldn't necessarily put any huge files in here that would take a lot of time to synchronize to a server if you're using roaming profiles. That said, I right clicked on my roaming profiles a while, or my uh, roaming data a while back, and it was several gigs. Uh, so I don't think necessarily people are honoring that. Local is supposed to be specific to just that individual computer. So if you had some like large uh, set of data that would be inconvenient to have synchronized up to uh, whatever server that the roaming profiles are going to, you might put in local. Then there's also local low, which is used from time to time by applications that are um, require a lower integrity level. Like for instance, um, you're using I think it's IE8 and newer, and using protected mode. There's certain places it's not allowed to write to, but it is allowed to write to local low. And this is a kind of a sort of sandbox measure to protect things. All right, Windows local accounts. Several different types of password hashes are stored, and I mentioned this briefly earlier. Land manager is the older style password hash that used to be used. But unfortunately, the algorithm is, is uh, stupidly simple, and if you have land manager hashes stored at all, pretty much the they're instantly crackable at this point. Uh, the password is converted to all uppercase. That takes care of that takes out a lot of entropy right there. Uh, they pad the plain text with null characters if it isn't long enough. Then they split into two seven character byte chunks. So um, because of the mathematics involved, it's actually easier to crack two seven character passwords than it is one fourteen character password. Because they can kind of split it up and work on it half and half. Uh, after that, they take a uh, known value and DES encrypt it with whatever the password is to generate the hash. And then they concatenate the two ciphertexts back together to produce the hash. Then they store it in the SAM file. But because ultimately you only have a seven character password ever with LM hashes, they become incredibly easy to crack and people have rainbow tables out there for pretty much every possible combination you could ever want. So if you have a few terabytes of storage, look it up in a rainbow table much instantaneously. This type of hash you'll find stored in the SAM and system. Actually, the, technically the hash is stored in the SAM. The reason you grab in the system is there's something that was introduced uh, in one particular version of NT4 called syskey. 
syskey is this extra level of obfuscation that they use to encrypt the SAM. Well, since the encryption key is already in the system file, and it needs, the system needs it to be able to unencrypt the SAM to actually use it, you just have to grab one more file and you're good. Now, there's some options when you in, have syskey enabled to say you have to use a floppy disk to be able to boot the system, but I don't know if anybody actually uses that particular scheme. It's a little more complex. Basically, you have Unicode characters um, that are uh, mixed case. That adds a lot more entropy right, the entropy right there better than uh, the all uppercase involved with Landman. They in, use MD4 to hash it, then they store the hash. There's all sorts of uh, free tools out there for dumping hashes. Uh, FGDump is one. This is a particular version of uh, the whole password dump utility. You can go into a SAM file and uh, dump out these password hashes. I like using Kane. You can point Kane at a SAM and system file, dump these password hashes, and start cracking. Or if you want to do it a little faster, you could use Kane for the convenience of dumping the hashes, then load everything into a tool called Hashcat. Hashcat actually comes on Backtrack, and uh, Hashcat, depending on the version you use, can use the GPU and crack much, much faster. But even its CPU based one is very fast and it's been highly optimized. Uh, these are a bunch of notes for uh, dumping a SAM file from Backtrack, but I don't really want to take the time to go into all of them. Those cache credentials I mentioned before, uh, those are a lot more secure than either LM hashes or NTLM hashes. Uh, they're stored in the following registry locations you see up on the screen. Um, if you talk about older style uh, cached credentials, back in Windows XP, what they essentially did, so I understand it, is they take the Unicode password. MD4 it, they uh, also take your username, Unicode and code that in all case, salt it with the MD4 hash, then MD4 it again. By having that salt in there, even if we have the same, you know, if we must have the same password, because this username is going to be different than mine, the hash will be different, so someone can't easily do the pre computation attacks. However, can still try to crack these at a decent speed, and um, <coughs> So can uh, Hashcat for that matter. So uh, in version two of uh, MS Cache, they added some more issues that they've used. Um, I think ten rounds of an extra level of hashing to make it a lot more CPU intensive to crack. And I was using Kane on it. I think I was uh, doing seventy passwords a second on a Core i7. So they've improved that even more. So at this point, assuming you're using the passphrase, you probably don't have to worry a whole lot about uh, cache domain credentials. But if you are worried about it, you can actually disable it. Uh, until recently, Windows 7 passwords that are stored using that MS Cache version 2 were not supported in Kane. Now Kane actually can dump them. And if I try loading them into Hashcat, Hashcat, the version that's publicly released on the website, last I checked, only supports version 1. There's a version that's in like private beta that does support version 2, and hopefully that'll eventually be out. But the format you'd load that into Hashcat is listed up here, where essentially you separate everything with the domain with the username because that's going to be part of the salt that it has to know to be able to crack that password. Uh, countering this, well, easiest countermeasure is just to have uh, LM hash or sorry, to, to turn off uh, cache credentials. But that causes usability issues if someone can't be if somebody has to be on a network segment that can reach the domain controllers. That's a bit of an issue. A better option is to make sure the person just has a more complex password that's going to be hard to brute force. And uh, if you really want to turn it off, you actually can go into the registry or use GPO to turn it off. But most people probably aren't going to want to do that. Also, if you have really fascist methods as far as keeping people from having physical access to a box, it's probably going to be fairly hard to dump these. Though, like I said, there is the remote exploitation and then dumping various uh, bits of data method I mentioned earlier. Okay, unknown apps. Let's say you have some unknown app that you know it's storing your password, but you're not sure where it's storing your password. There's some great tools out there for mapping out, all right, where in the registry is this particular application writing, and where in the file system is this application writing. You can fire up one of these tools, point it at a process, and it'll show you all the places in the registry that it's making edits, and all different place, places in the file system it's making edits. You can backtrack through that and go, huh, this particular tool just opened up this file as soon as I entered my password and told it to store it. Hmm, maybe that's where the passwords are. If you ever actually want to semi-reverse engineer it and find that information out, these free tools are great. Process, process Activity View, Redtrim App, and uh, of course Procmon. Check out all the system internal tools. Procmon is one of them. But you can sit there and watch what's writing the file system, watch what's writing in the registry, uh, maybe see what other things it's firing off, also see what network activity it's doing. 
just an awesome tool to figure out what an EXE is doing if you're not good at uh, reverse engineering at like the assembly level, which I ain't. So if you don't know how it's hashed, but you found where the password is stored, you think, but you show it's how it's hashed, well, you can look at the kind of um, data there and compare it to other hashes and hopefully try to figure it out. Also, you can try uh, entering uh, the password password, see how it stores it, then searching for that hash online. I've actually had good success cracking passwords by doing a Google search for the hash. Because someone else has already cracked it for me and I can just find it in Google. Um, let's see. As far as passwords in Firefox, it's actually stored in the user's profile in the its Firefox profile, and there's gonna be a random string in there. But while it's in these little DB files, these little SQL light DB files, looking at those directs a pain. Luckily, Anir has a tool called Password Fox that will instantly dump these passwords for you. If you don't have access to that particular um, account though and logging into them, you can also just point it to the user's profile, and assuming they're not using some kind of master password you can suck up all the passwords from Firefox that way. There are similar tools for doing the exact same thing in Chrome and uh, IE7 and newer as well. Um, similar issue, here I was going to try to dump some passwords from uh, IE. However, the way IE did it, if I wasn't logged in as the current user, I actually had to know the user's password for that particular profile to be able to extract the data, which uh, kind of makes things a little bit more difficult. A bunch of great apps out there for um, grabbing passwords. Uh, all these tools here I have listed. Uh, Password Fox, of course, for dumping Firefox. IE PassView. Uh, Chrome Pass for dumping stuff in Chrome. But all of these come in that Nearsoft pack I mentioned. So it's easier generally just to download 120 meg download than it is to grab each one of these individually. DNC is another easy thing to grab passwords from, at least in some older versions. They would actually store the password in an easily deobfuscated form in the registry. So you could just reach out there and grab it. In the case of Ultra DNC, you could go into an INI file and grab it. But both Kane and Near produce tools you can use to um, decode that data and find someone's VNC password. Then again, so many different versions of VNC, your mileage may vary. It depends on which particular version of VNC you happen to have implemented. It used to be back in the day on uh, RDP, where if you said store my password with my uh, RDP session, remote desktop protocol, it would actually store the password inside that RDP file you created. So whenever you use that as a shortcut, it would be inside there. Newer versions, uh, I believe, store it in the same place they've stored network credentials. But if you can capture one of those RDP files, 10 minutes, you can actually uh, suck passwords out of it. In messaging, uh, show me instant messages when you say passwords store stuff inside that app, those app data folders I mentioned earlier and uh, Nearsoft has a lot of tools for extracting all those passwords and going back into the whole password reuse thing someone uses the same password for both the messaging and for the you know corporate LAN account probably way more common than we want it to be so just because it's not a password you're interested in that same password may be reused on some system you are interested in and like I said all these Message Pass, this little tool from Nearsoft, can uh, decode the passwords for all of these different IM tools. So I think that covers most of your bases right there. The print's probably too small for somebody in the back of the room to even be able to read. Covers a lot of ground. Uh, if you ever stored your password for network shares, you can also recover that using uh, one of Nears tools, as uh, I believe also Kane has that ability, though you may have to be logged in as the person to do it or know the last uh, known password to be able to do it. Uh, see, wireless. As I mentioned before, you can use wireless key view to um, suck passwords off of a system, which is really nice. And of course, all this passwords. You see, I spent most of my time on passwords, but if you have someone's password. It's such an integral bit of uh, data to have to be able to walk your way through a network. Let's quickly talk about some other data that you might be interested in grabbing. Uh, out cache uh, information. If you have um. If you have Outlook running in cached exchange mode, the conversion Outlook you have, it's actually storing all these emails in an OST file in, the, in this location. I need to use this profile app data local Microsoft Outlook. You can go in there, grab that OST file, and you have all the email. Uh, there's a tool out there called um, Current OST Viewer where you can open it up and start looking through the person's emails and find out what they've been uh, up to. 
also uh, Outlook attachments. Now, my understanding is Outlook, when you close it, is supposed to um, delete this. However, if you open up a Word document from email, then you closed Outlook, but you had that Word document still open, well, it might get stored in this particular location, and you can see things have been sent to someone as attachments in Outlook. Um, by the way, this particular path, as I mentioned right here, you may have to forcefully browse to it. When I tried to use Explore to get to it, it wouldn't actually show me the directory, but if I manually entered the string, it would let me in. Skype logs are interesting. Like this is a uh, one of these tools showing me uh, information from my Skype log of all the people I've been uh, talking to recently. As useful information for a social engineering attack later on. Uh, looking at the local logs uh, in Windows XP, this is going to be event files underneath uh, Sys32 config. In Visual New, it should be underneath uh, Sys32 Win Event Logs in .evtx files. Besides giving you get general information about what's going on in the system, these are good places to look for passwords. How many people have ever fat fingered a password and started typing so fast that they end up typing the use the password in the username field? Well, because of the silly way in which they uh, log do logs, if you have RTing enabled, your password just gets stored as a failed username inside that event log. So you can start looking through it for failed attempts, then look for the very next successful attempt. I actually have tools on my website, one I call a PibCat, a uh, problem exists between chair and keyboard attack where you can scan for these event logs and go, oh, failed login, really weird name, this is a successful login, this might be the person's password, and correlate them that way. Uh, Windows pools are also interesting. People send stuff that's confidential to the printer all the time, and if it doesn't quite make it, it may actually get stored in uh, the spool directory inside of printers. Sorry, inside of printers inside the spool directory. You can use various tools that I have listed at this URL to actually look at those either PostScript files or PCL files and see what they are and replay them. So many other options. I mean, there's like Windows Explorer history, uh, IE cookies to tell where someone's been. This is why I said this was a bad choice as far as topics, because there's just so many different things you might want to grab off a system. Uh, Firefox history, know where the person's been going, uh, Firefox cookies, so on and so forth. Now, a little word, uh, word about uh, automation. I didn't even know Russell was going to be in the room today. I didn't know he was going to be at the conference. But if you're interested in automating all this, grabbing all this stuff by hand is going to suck. You can make a U3 thumb drive that as soon as you plug it in, assuming they have auto run turned on, will automatically grab all this data. Most systems anymore, this isn't going to work on, but you can still go to the thumb drive, quickly double click one little script and have it grab all the stuff for you. So go check out uh, his information. I'm hosting it for him on my website. Uh, but we've also done a lot of work on... Uh, his particular thing was for uh, instant response, so you can instantly grab a bunch of data and Correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea was you don't want to box up that's compromised, constantly affecting other machines in your network. However, if you shut it down right now, you may lose very important data to figure out who actually compromised the box. So this is kind of a compromise. You use this, it dumps that core data, like what processor is running, what users logged in, uh, maybe even, uh, other data that's useful for live forensics, then you can shut down the machine. So it's kind of a compromise between the two. Is that a good enough explanation? Perfect. Uh, but there's also uh, the Hack5 wiki, which has even more information on making these little U3 thumb drives. Other resources you might be interested in, uh, I mentioned a lot about boot media earlier. I have whole videos and presentations on uh, making multiple, multiple boot USB drives. Like I said, the one in my pocket, I have a video out there so you can do a boot backtrack and Windows uh, 7 PE and Ultimate Boot Steve for Windows all from one thumb drive. So go check that out. Uh, also, password expectation class. If you're more interested in, I covered a lot of stuff in passwords very quickly here. In that class, we basically took, I don't know, three or four hours to cover all these topics. And we sit there and show you how the tool works, how to crack a password, where to get it from. So I highly recommend checking out that long form class. And it's out on my website already. And uh, a little bit more information on portable boot devices in general. The top link is just mostly Windows 7 PE specific, but the bottom link is more general, what else out there as far as uh, useful uh, bootable distributions. Even more resources for people. If you're interested in uh, forensically sensitive spots inside of Windows 7, Vista, and XP, I have a very long, very small URL up there that you can go to that will list more uh, places you may want to try to extract data from. Uh, I also have a text article on uh, building those boot uh, USBs and CDs I mentioned before. Rubik's has done a lot of work recently and uh, on post-exploitation on both uh, Windows and Linux. And these particular Google Docs have huge lists that him and other people have compiled for 
okay, you got access to a machine. What stuff do you want to dump? What, what commands should you use to find sensitive information? Because it's one thing to pop a box, but ultimately popping the box doesn't matter if you can't get compromising data off of it. That's what the uh, uh, organization really cares about. So he's contained some really great lists, and uh, they're continuing to uh, expand that. A few events I'd like to announce. Louisville InfoSec is coming up on the 29th. That's up, of course, in Louisville, Kentucky, as the name implies. And the very next day after it, September 30th to October 2nd, there's DerbyCon. Last I checked, uh, we have 847 people who are supposed to be there, and we're still a few weeks out, so hopefully we can get a few more than that. But going to come up, um, some speakers you may have heard of would be people like Dave Kennedy, Kevin Mitnick, um, H.D. Moore. So make it if you can. A bunch of other conferences in the area that I go to, HackerCon in West Virginia, SkydogCon, which is happening this year in Nashville. At the same time as Freaknik, I don't want to get into that debate. What? Yes, Freak is also in Nashville. Uh, not a con up in Cleveland, and an out of zone way down in Atlanta, all ones I also recommend going to if you're more interested in the technical side of uh, computer security. I don't know if there are any questions, but I may not have any time, and I spoke a mile a minute, and I apologize for that. Yes? It, it may be very basic and something you can't answer in a second, but if you mentioned encryption at the beginning, if somebody has their box encrypted, does that pretty much negate everything? If you have full hard drive encryption, it negates pretty much everything I've talked about here. Now, some exceptions to that. I suppose that they find a really a big weakness in how they implement the encryption. My encryption generally isn't broken. The implementation is broken. Someone screws the pooch in some other way, allows them to compromise it. There's something called the cold boot attack, where uh, for your password or for you to be able to get the hard drive, that key has to be someplace in memory. If someone gets your machine fast enough, they can possibly use a tool to extract the key from memory while the machine is still in a state where they can do that, and then use that to decrypt the hard drive. However, the research on that, basically they have to capture the laptop so quickly, pull out the RAM, keep it cold to keep it from losing that, and quickly get it somewhere else. So, how practical an attack is to pull off, I don't know. More than likely, if you turn off your machine and do this while the person tries to grab it, you're probably going to be fairly safe. <laughs> okay. So, the thing, but assuming that the full hard drive encryption is um, doing its job correctly, it's going to negate a large percentage of this. Well, that's, that's assuming the machine's not live, right? That's assuming, oh yes, that is very much assuming uh, the machine's not live. I didn't think to mention that. Uh, yes, for instance, Stefan Boschert case, this guy, I think that's his name. Um, he was coming across, I believe, the Canadian border, and they found some stuff they thought was child porn. But they shut the machine down. Then when they boot back up, it went, they, the entire hard drive was encrypted. And, of course, he didn't want to give the key. And then there was this whole debate on whether or not he had... Um, I think, was it Fifth Amendment or Fourth Amendment rights? I think it was Fifth Amendment rights to not reveal the password. So there's a lot of debate there. But yes, if the machine's up and running still, then uh, I guess your hard drive encryption is not going to do a whole lot of good. And I've heard of systems that use full hard drive encryption, but they actually boot up and there's no password on the initial login account. Kind of missing the point, but all right. Thanks. No problem. And also, too, if they use a simple passphrase for the full disk encryption, a lot of all this encryption like PGP and stuff can be dictionary attacks. Oh, okay. And you can mount it using an external system. So it doesn't really matter the, whether it's PGP or TrueCrypt if they've got an easy password, right? It depends on which product they're using, it's really whether there's a tool to dictionary attack mount it. Can you recommend a good tool for that? Because I haven't done a whole lot of cracking of full hard, uh, full hard drive encryption. Uh, if you want to see the scripts for dictionary attacking PGP, you can look at my blog, swordstarcher.com. I have some scripts there for it. Can you oh, done. Somebody asked, well, you can that again. Oh, uh, George Starcher's blog. What's your, what is your URL? Just georgestarcher.com. Georgestarcher.com. He has various scripts out there for automating the process of brute force password cracking or looking. I'm assuming what you're doing is attack. dictionary attack, where you're basically uh, yeah, brute force is a slightly different issue. Brute force is where you try different characters and try all possibilities. Dictionary attack, you're just throwing word after word after word of a list. And then there's hybrid attacks that are combinations of that. Well, I'm assuming what your script is doing is it's actually doing this dictionary attack, trying to mount it, see if it fails or not. Exactly. And when it finally succeeds, you go, hey, this must yeah. be the password. And, and that's where password reuse comes in handy. So if you're like working a forensics case and someone has a machine that they use they didn't protect too well, maybe you can scrape those passwords off the strings and then use those as a dictionary. It, and they might be using the exact same that's password. Got time for one more question. Uno mas. Adrian, you, you mentioned earlier um, about passwords that, that like transmutation with ROT routine, 
things like that. We were up until recently uh, at Murray State, uh, we had a, a database application that used. They talked about how encrypted they were, how <laughs> everything was, because all of the variables in the database were encrypted. And what they meant was they turned it around backwards and rocked their heat in them. And they didn't tell us that, but our, one of our DBAs was looking through his own information and said, that looks like my name spelled backwards. Uh, so we, we were able, oh, yeah. able to figure out that their quote-unquote you know, industry-leading encryption for all of their information was all the variables were backwards and ROT 13. Well, I'm a very security-conscious guy, so pretty much all the email I ever send is either ROT 26 encrypted or double XORed with a one-time pad. But uh, I guess that's it for time. If anybody has any questions, let me know. I'll be around the conference. Um, thank you much for your time. Thank you.